Uh, but I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker to you all today. Uh, I am really excited that Dr. Stefan Curtis is here with us today. I have read a lot of his uh, published work in the past, and I'm super excited to hear what he has to say. Before he begins, I have a quick introduction I want to read to you guys. Dr. Curtis is a professor of medicine and a primary care physician at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He holds appointments in the School of Public Health and the UAB Center for Outcomes and Effectiveness Research and Education. He is a doctor of medicine from Harvard Medical School in 1993 and a Master of Sciences or Mathematics in Public Health from Boston University in 2002. His background includes 23 years of experience in health services research and clinical care of vulnerable or stigmatized populations where serious illness, substance use, severe pain, and social adversity co-occur in ways that can prove challenging. He has 18 years of federal research support from the National Institute of Drug Abuse and the Veteran Health Veterans Health Administration Health Services Research and Development Merit Program. Much of his research has focused on care of persons where homelessness, pain, and substance dependence challenges challenge clinicians, patients, and health systems. Additionally, since 2016, he has published several highly cited, peer-reviewed, and lay papers focused on patients with long-term pain who have undergone opioid medication reduction, sometimes without their agreement. This work includes database analyses of associations between prescription opioid change and overdose or suicide, as well as analyses of prescription opioid de-implementation as an organizational undertaking. In pursuing these issues, he has developed close relationships with national networks of patients with long-term pain, with suicide scholars, and with public agencies focused on pain like the National Pain Advocacy Center. So without any further delay, Dr. Gertus, thank you so much for being here. Please take it away. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. I'm thankful for colleagues who were able to join today, including a patient I collaborate and uh, collaborate with Anne Fuqua and two research collaborators I work with right now. Um, the title of the talk is shown, Irrational Exuberance, Incautious Stoppage, Ethical Failure, Lessons from Our Prescription Opioid Story. Um, let me go ahead and uh, advance. This talk combines policy history and science and my own views, which are opinions. Where I present my opinions, they are not formal positions of the Department of Veterans Affairs. I really uh, take the position that it's helpful to detail evidence, even when the evidence is not perfect ammunition for one's advocacy. I think one of the biggest problems we have right now is the ways in which people spin evidence to say what they wanted to say. And I think it's part of how we got into prescribing and uh, how we've uh, reduce prescribing in the wrong way. I don't own pharmaceutical stock. I previously had some CVS, uh, which was sold as soon as I found out my broker had bought it. My spouse has her own stocks. I have turned down all requests to work in opioid litigation and I've received requests from both sides. People who might not, uh, who subscribe to Hulu might be aware of a show up, it's up right now. This is called Dope Sick starring Michael Keaton. I think he was on 60 Minutes on Sunday night. And I've started watching it. Uh, so this story of opioids and how the pills got started is very much on our minds. This is based on a book, however. It's even though the, it's a dramatization, the book underneath it is not a fictional story. It's by Beth Macy. It details key points that emerge in the show as well. Ravenous marketing of opioids, denial by Purdue, uh, the reality that this wasn't just a matter for poor rural people, uh, that supply can induce demand. Um, I'm going to turn a little bit to Beth Macy's book. I've uh, read a good chunk of it, not all of it, uh, but I like it. Um, and there are many, many books on the U.S. opioid story. Beth is a journalist. Uh, she's based in Virginia. Her book, which was published a few years back, includes a good number of well-off suburban and middle-class people who uh, seem to just basically have their lives wrecked by the emergence of OxyContin in their communities and then heroin. <laughs> Uh, there's a chat comment. I want to make sure I know what that is. Oh, good. Thanks, Sujith. I'll go back. Um, back, 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 back. I want to go back so you can see Beth's face. Okay. Yeah, so the um, her book defies expectations about who fall, fell through the cracks of our opioid <laughs> crisis, often middle-class people. In reading it, I felt real outrage at Purdue and real kinship with a physician who grew angry and concerned about what he saw in his community and who had trouble getting traction for that concern when he began to raise it. I think I identified with the physician. 
among most books on this crisis, the patients with pain are actually not part of the story. And that's going to be a theme uh, for today's talk. Now, as people understand contextually, there's been a big rise and then a very large reduction in prescriptions. This is information put out by the Food and Drug Administration just recently. And it shows that um, you know, we're down to levels of prescribing in terms of the number of prescriptions last seen in 1992. Uh, if you were to look at milligrams, that would still be around 2001. Uh, we can get into that later, but obviously it's, it's fallen immensely. The, um, and I'm just setting the context. All of this is just to stage, set the stage. There have been some emergent ramifications of the reduction that we made and the speed of that reduction. And I think it's not widely appreciated that there have been a, spur, a spate of reports of people who uh, have died by suicide, long-term recipients of opioids with severe pain and disability, whose opioids were reduced or stopped, often uh, be some before and a lot after the, the CDC's guideline, and, and just chose that it was best to die. And the case there is from Fox News, but there are many others. I've read the medical record on that one. I can vouch for what happened. Uh, NPR on the right actually reported on reductions in the emergency department, predominantly affecting African-Americans with sickle cell disease. Uh, don't forget there are many racial ramifications to our opioid story. Uh, reductions typically have affected blacks first. And I you know, commented in the media about patients who suffered medical deterioration after opioid stoppage. All of this is by way of stage seven. Don't worry, we're gonna explain this. The four questions for today are how did US policy embrace liberal prescribing of opioids? And for many of you, this will have an element of review, although I hope to make it interesting and dramatic. Then how did US policy shift to a reduction? What are the factors that make policy happen so that there's a big reduction that's heavily focused on long-term recipients? What's the evidence for or against taper or stoppage in long-term opioid prescription recipients and what lessons have I personally learned that might help others who want to address problems in health policy? And I recall that this class is people who are going to be engaged in issues of pharmacy administration and pharmacy policy. And there are going to be times when you might decide that you wish to address a problem that emerges in the public sphere. And you might decide that you want to take a stand. Um, and um, I learned some lessons in that process that I intend to share. Well, how did opioid prescribing rise in the US? Um, there's some noise we may need to have somebody turn off their microphone. Uh, just maybe just hit mute if you can. Um, the concept I want to introduce to you is a policy monopoly, which comes from the policy analysis literature. The policy monopoly is a collection of agents who control the definition of problems that deserve to be solved, the voices that deserve to be heard, and the methods that deserve to be considered for solving those problems. And that's really a summary of work. That's a summary I wrote, but in relation to a, paper, a book by Paul Kearney, which I strongly recommend purchasing called Understanding Public Policy. In the case of opioids, our policy monopoly from the 1990s to about 2012 included doctors, uh, uh, medical societies, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, plenty of other regulatory agencies, including my own employer, the VA, pharmacy leadership, medical educators, healthcare regulators, hospital and health system management, they all tilted in the direction of treating pain with opioids aggressively. So typically what you see are people and agencies, they don't all work for each other, but they have aligned financial and ideological commitments, and they will usually work to counter opposing views. So like that doctor in Dopesick, when he said there's problems, of course, uh, people pushed back and said, what are you talking about? You couldn't possibly know. You're just a lowly doctor. Um, so how did prescriptions rise? Well, there was this push to address pain uh, beginning in the 1990s. It, it began with essays by noted scholars who were deep, uh, including an NIH scholar, was deeply concerned with pain. The U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs took that up. It's not the leader, but I draw attention because it's one of the first agencies to adopt pain as a fifth vital sign. And I'm not saying, I actually believe we should continue to assess pain and care, but that was part of a pressure to prescribe when it was taken up. Marketing and weak regulation uh, were uh, combined. Uh, you can see this in shows, you can read it in the media. There was a lot of promotion of pretty weak data about low addiction risk. And there was treatment of dependence as always a benign thing, other than a few people who were called addicts in a very stigmatizing way. 
Also, it's fair to say that pills and the prescribing of pills were always simpler to do and more profitable than other types of comprehensive pain care. And the background for all of this rise is crucial. Most of us who are clinicians had no training in pain or in addiction or in disability or re in rehabilitation. This meant that unlike say hypertension or diabetes where a drug company could make claims to me and I would evaluate those claims in light of all the training I had in medical school, um, many clinicians received claims about opioids without really having had any training at all. And I, I really want to insist that you understand this, that Purdue Pharma did not require medical schools to offer no training in pain and addiction. They were offering no training by choice prior to a, a corporation. But needless to say, <laughs> Purdue Pharma played a mighty role in this story. Um, this is an advertisement on the left-hand side. It says, take the next step in pain relief. It's the OxyContin ad, Q12 hours, rapid onset of analgesia. And this advertising is legal in the United States of America. And I think that's a problematic policy to permit. In the, in the vision of the pictures shown here, pain is really seen as an orthopedic condition, kind of solved by specific organs that you could probably get fixed. The impact, the implication here is that getting the opioid will make stair runners out of you. The 12 hour claim was uh, permitted by the FDA, but there were internal Purdue data showing that this was often not true and that there were real problems as the pills wore off. And prior to the reformulation of OxyContin, these pills were easily broken to get an immediate and enormous dose in illicit users or people seeking a rush. There were many communities where there were sort of rivers of pills. Um, Kermit, uh, I think this is um, one, many, one of many communities covered by Eric Ear, who works in South Carolina, the 400 residents. In one period of 10 months in the early 2000s, they got 3 million pills, about 10,000 pills a day. Obviously, even if you include the county surrounding Kermit, it's just not a lot. From 2006 to 2012, the distributor McKesson sent no suspicious order reports to the Drug Enforcement Agency. Of course, as soon as they got the sense that there was some scrutiny, they sent thousands. Uh, there is sort of an ecosystem of pill mills, Blythe Pharmacies, the DEA, and redistribution. And in a review of this book by Eric Kerr, who won the Pulitzer Prize for this work, she does note certain kind of lingering questions. How do we reconcile the structural causes of addiction, things like poverty, social malaise, internal cues like anxiety, growing up without a sense of internal security, with personal choice and the agency and the decisions made by the users and the sellers? It is easy to overlook those things, uh, when we pay what I think is justifiable attention to the distribution. There are many simple claims made when we discuss the opioid crisis, and many of them are too simple. So I want to introduce those as well. One is the U.S. prescribes more opioids than elsewhere, and the U.S. as a country is not in less pain. I'm going to broker these claims in a moment. Uh, four out of five of today's heroin users began with a prescribed opioid. I heard this at a FDA Duke Margolis session just a few weeks ago. The U.S. consumes 80% of the world's opioids, but has a very small percentage of its population. And opioids are not effective for chronic pain. This was actually stated in federal court uh, suing the opioid manufacturers. So these are actually not such simple claims when you adjudicate them. It's actually true that U.S. doctors prescribe more than elsewhere and that the country appears not to be in less pain on standard statistical surveys. It's an accurate claim. Um, it doesn't have a lot of context as to who's in pain or where they are, what is the history, or who are we as Americans, but it's still, I think, true. The four out of five heroin user statement is a miscitation. It's not entirely an un a false thing because there's a real paper behind it by McCurry in 2013, but it's a paper that looks at single first-time use of heroin, which was often single-time use of heroin, among 12 to 49-year-olds from 2002 to 2011, and who were asked whether they had previously ever misused, for non-medical purposes, an opioid type pill. And a high percentage who had used heroin once or more said, yes, I have. Um, it doesn't mean that they all got it at a doctor's office and became addicted. In fact, most didn't. Most of these people didn't necessarily continue to use heroin either. It's just a one-time use. But that's the paper. Uh, the U.S. consumes 80% of the world's opioids is false. Uh, it's simply a claim made by a drug enforcement agency agent at a conference in 2004. Uh, when you look at international data, it's closer to 50%, so it's still a lot, but it's not 80. And opioids are not effective for chronic pain. Uh, I'll come back to this, but even the most skeptical of reviews says they are effective for pain, 
The amount of long-term data is limited, however, and they're not statistically superior on average. But I think underlying a lot of these discussions is an issue that I think gets to the heart of a weakness of thought, both for the medical profession, but also in the pharmacy profession. And these are some very simple lines, and I don't like them. <laughs> Patient with pain, arrow, prescription opioid. And prescription opioid, arrow, overdose. And they sort of imply linear relationships. And in any NPR story, this is the kind of thing they talk about even when they're trying to do a good job. I'm gonna just disentangle one of them. I think when you think about a person with pain, this is not really how I think about the care of such a person, particularly chronic pain. In reality, the decisions and the understanding of the patient who has long-term pain are tied up with all these elements of the psychosocial model that influence the severity of the pain, the likely prior history, uh, biological and tissue injury, psychological conditions, social conditions, and they include factors that have to influence our decisions and how they are coping, like life context, prior trauma from the healthcare system, which is so common with disabled populations, and disability. And none of this is taught in medical school or in most health profession schools, even though these are so relevant to the manifestations of pain and to the decisions we have to make. And when we make decisions, we're not just deciding on a prescription opioid, we're considering a range of options. It, it, I'm sure there are clinicians who have just decided on an opioid, but most of the time, the way we're trying to figure things out is which of these options might work for this person in this context. And that usually is denuded from our public discourse. So I just wanna draw attention to that. As promised, the second question is how did US policy shift from to such a rapid reduction of opioids heavily involving long-term recipients? Again, that's the reduction as per the FDA, they're using commercial data here. And I, I guess I wanna step back before I show you that incredibly busy graphic to say, lots of actors acted at once as it became clear there was a problem with excess prescribing. And it's not just one, it's not just the CDC guideline, it's not just that uh, Dr. Lemke wrote a book called Doctors as Drug Dealers uh, or you know, Drug Dealer MD. It's not just that uh, we started to hear different things from payers and it's not just that CVS Pharmacy has a new policy. Everyone acted at once. So there were governmental actors, the Congress passed laws, the Support Act passed in 2018 says that state Medicaid programs must have a dose limit in their prescription of opioids. And they could choose to have a dose limit that doesn't take into account what people have previously received. The Food and Drug Administration has power and acts, Health and Human Services, uh, the Department of Justice has power to initiate investigations based on information it can obtain, including from Health and Human Services. There could be state regulators, boards, colleges. There's guidances and metrics in the lower left-hand side of that. The CDC guideline was very influential, even though prescribing began to drop before it came out, it sped up after it came out. There are other guidelines, guidances. On the lower right-hand side, I show payers and other entities like pharmacy chains. Some pharmacies simply said, we're not gonna fill doses above a certain dose. Uh, other pharmacies were put out of business because they serve too many patients with pain. Pharmacy benefit management companies impose policies, malpractice insurers, to tell their practices what they will cover. And finally, most of us clinicians don't have enough time to read all the documents that these agencies generate. So we're heavily influenced. I mean, I just basically want to stay a doctor. I don't want to stop being what I hoped to be as a kid. And so I look to journalism and what I hear in the news to decide what the general gestalt of the moment is on something like opioids. And this is an alliance of interests who share a scientific assessment of a problem they also share financial interests and liabilities related to opioid crisis, and they are under political pressure. And I wanna remind you that when you have an alliance of scientific assessments, financial interests, and political pressures, that actually is a kind of policy monopoly. It's just a different one from the one we had before. And one more point about this graph, where are the patients? The patients who had that long-term pain, they're not really making the policy about what's happening to them. And that's a pretty important gap as we'll go forward. Just as an example, quality metrics are used to assess the quality of care, and there are hundreds of them, maybe thousands. One of the major types of quality metrics used by health plans is put out by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. It's called HEDIS, 
And they measure things related to medications and preventive care. And they adopted a metric at the recommendation of others called use of opioids at high dosage, greater than 90 milligrams per day. There is uh, an exception uh, for hospice alone. If, you can, if, if it's possible to implement it, you're allowed to implement such an exception. But there's no exception for complex illness. There's no exception if the patient's currently stable on 120. The basic concept here is for a health plan, the number of patients over 90 counts against the health plan, no matter what the condition of those patients. It pushes, in effect, a dose reduction across the board, and many payers took it up in that way. It's enforced in various ways, and it's built into incentive payment systems, and the same greater than 90 milligram threshold is also built into legal investigation thresholds, although they pay even closer attention to greater than 240 milligrams. So that's a powerful mechanism. Of course, I'm not gonna give examples of all the others, but as one side example, prescription drug monitoring programs, sometimes helpful to a prescriber. If you do pharmacy practice, you're gonna be expected to check them. They're also used by law enforcement, but there's a key challenge with these programs. Although they work as a health record, these are not subject to HIPAA or privacy regulations. And although it, they include a score of your opioid risk and work like a credit score, you don't have the right to review or challenge or freeze it the way you do with your credit score. So your potential ability to receive or prescribe medicine is influenced by this score in the way that your ability to acquire a loan is influenced by a different proprietary score. But on this one, you don't have the right to look at it. And the fascinating thing is that the score that's packaged into PDMPs, which is called NarcoScare, is actually going to be owned by the same, one of the same companies that provides credit scores, Equifax. And it'll be interesting to see if with two lines of, of, of product, one on credit, and one on health, will they choose to adopt the same rules uh, for both or will they continue to maintain the stratification in which uh, some of the rights you have for your credit score, you just won't have for your, your, your NarcoScare score. I put in a reference to an article by Maya Salovitz from Wired, it's worth Googling. Um, this is a controversial domain, but all parties, no matter what their view, agree on one thing, which is don't stop opioids rapidly in people who receive them long-term. And sadly, it turned out that that was not adhered to over these last several years. In fact, 2019, the Food and Drug Administration put out an announcement um, saying that there's been harm from sudden discontinuation of opioid medicines. I was one of many parties who contacted them and provided information to them. And initially, 2017, there were these anecdotal reports, uh, patients being turned away from clinicians, having their prescriptions stopped that they'd been on for many years, and it was kind of anecdotal. And when these anecdotes were raised, they were routinely challenged as anecdote. However, research came out, and I'll show you three studies quickly, but these are from good journals. This is from Journal of Journal Internal Medicine. It looks at long-term opioid recipients in Medicare Part D, and it identified what they term abrupt discontinuation as something that increased by 49%, relatively speaking, amongst those long-term opioid recipients in Medicare Part D. The proportion of discontinuations that were abrupt also rose, so that when there was a stoppage, it was 81% uh, were likely to be abrupt by 2017. Uh, that's by Niprash and Barnett. This is from Brad Stein. Uh, it's online only right now, but it will be in the Journal of General Internal Medicine. In US national prescribing data, they use a slightly different approach to identifying uh, rapid discontinuation. They say somebody who reached zero milligrams after being at over 40 milligrams um, in one day in the last 21 before they stopped or over 20, one day in the last seven. And of 810,120 discontinuations in national prescribing data, 72% uh, met that criterion for being rapid discontinuation. And then rapid tapers, I won't go into such detail, but this is from 2019 in JAMA Network Open. Again, rapid tapering rose in the Medicare program. So all the advocacy to make us judicious and cautious in prescribing of opioids, which I think is correct, led to something that was incautious. It's also being reported publicly. This is from this month uh, on Twitter, but I, I see hundreds, maybe thousands of these at this point. 
individual reports of a family member refused to fill her opioid prescription. Doctor stated, I know that you need them, but my license and practice is more important than your life. I'm too scared of the DEA to prescribe what you need. And at the time he discontinued her opioid, she was on, and then she states what she was on, which is a lot of different opioids. Uh, this would be a traumatic event for any patient. Have I fact-checked this particular tweet? No. The problem is that I have seen enough cases like this to know that these are likely to be true in many instances. Obviously, um, it wouldn't be right to ignore the actual number of overdose deaths from opioids that have occurred in the US during this period of prescription change. In showing you this graph, I think it's clear that we're going to reach uh, record highs. It may well be that for 2021, we'll exceed 100,000. Many of those overdoses involve synthetic, illicitly derived fentanyl products. There's an extremely active debate about whether the constriction of the prescription supply caused or contributed in a causal way to this rise in death, or if this uh, rise was baked into the cake because of the earlier rise in prescriptions and the market shift is not due. And I'm not going to adjudicate that. I do have some comments on it in an article from 2017 uh, from the journal Substance Abuse called Turning the Tide or Riptide. It's online, people have posted it, but I'm not gonna adjudicate it. What I do wanna say is there was one goal that arguably was advanced in all these reductions. And I'm very concerned about the long-term recipients. But the one thing that people did say is, you know, part of the reason to reduce prescriptions is to reduce the exposure of young adults who would develop addiction. This is national data. It's national data collected first in high school and then sequential years after high school uh, with government funding through monitoring the future. The question I'm showing you is for persons aged 19 to 30, looking at successive cohorts in that age range, who were asked if in the last year they had misused, I mean, not for medical purposes, Vicodin, a question they started in 2002, or narcotics other than heroin, a question they actually started in the 80s. That has really gone down. So if that one goal of reducing the misuse of these drugs arguably was advanced by the reduction in prescription availability. It's in fact the lowest it's been in the history of this survey. And I bear that in mind when people say we need to reduce further. The, you can follow the orange line back to 1988 and it's never been lower. So it's just not clear to me we can make it lower no matter what we do in long-term pain care. So today's demands for reduction usually no longer focus on which year we should go back to, but on the fact that we prescribe more than other countries. And I want to underscore an arithmetic problem that is sometimes missed in those discussions because it, it, it affects whose care is changed. 75% of the milligrams in the US go to long-term recipients. This was published in Annals of Internal Medicine. So our declines have depended it, particularly in milligrams and even in prescriptions in good part on cutting the doses in long-term recipients or stopping prescriptions in those long-term recipients. It's just the most efficient way to make a number go down. These are people who are easy to find in databases. They're often disabled. They don't have much political sway and they're not the easiest patients to treat for clinicians. So stopping that prescription looks like a pretty attractive step for both insurers and for clinicians. And the question I really wanna to put to you is should we continue to effectively incentivize or mandate reductions in this population, some of whom even the CDC guideline of 2016 would acknowledge may well need to go above 90 milligrams per, uh, you know, per day. To address that, we need to speak about contradictory evidence. And remember what I said at the beginning, I like to tell the full story. I don't just like to offer one side or the other. The argument for reducing the dose in a long-term recipient starts with correlations between the dose prescribed and overdose. Risks correlate retrospectively with the prescribed dose. I'm looking at, on the right-hand side of my screen, a blue table, which shows the overdose rate if you were to treat 1,000 veterans for a year using the data from 2004 to 2008 in the Veterans Administration, at different doses. And I should caution that 
our prescribing in the VA was not careful at that time. There was lots of co-prescribing with benzodiazepines. We often prescribed without attempting other things first, but there was a correlation and being at a higher dose was associated with a higher rate of overdose death. Now, not a sky high. I mean, you can have a conversation. If I were to say to you, I have a treatment, it might help you, but there's a three per thousand rate of overdose death with this treatment if we do it carelessly like they did in 2005. To me, that's a conversation rather than an absolute rule, but that's what it is. And there's also volatility of pain and volatility of emotion that can develop on opioids that may be due to the opioids. And that means that they're not a great treatment. They're, they're, they're sometimes helpful. I'll come back to that. And then at the very extreme of that is opioid use disorder or addiction, which is a small percentage of people. So among papers on the benefits or possible benefits of taper or stoppage, uh, Joseph Frank in 2017 reviewed 40 studies. These are typically small retrospective studies, including five small trials. Most were short-term and they involve voluntary patients who received high touch services. And even in that good context, Frank wrote very low quality evidence that opioid dose reduction may improve pain, function, and quality of life. Mackey in 2020 did a review meant to update Frank's review with a little bit more veteran emphasis. And they tried to find newer studies. And they said that the net balance of benefit and harm to long-term opioid dose reduction was unclear. And remember, the policies are all meant to push the reduction. So to say that we're pushing something where the net balance of benefit and harm to a patient is unclear raises a real ethical question. There's not many treatments that I would push on the notion that they have an unclear benefit. But it's also unclear for the serious harms that I've been concerned about, such as substance use, overdose, and suicide. There's other observational work that's been published in the last year or so that also could favor taper policies. Some of it's been funded by the Veterans Administration involving uh, Corey Hayes and uh, Aaron Krebs. There's a VA prospective study called EPOC or EPIC, I'm not sure how to say it. And they looked at long-term recipients of opioids from 2016 to 17 and surveyed them and followed them over time. And first of all, in the baseline analysis, over 50% rated their pain treatment as fair or poor, regardless of what dose they were on. So they weren't doing great on pills that were supposed to help them. There was not in a very, very small subsidiary analysis, which we could debate in terms of every decision made, but there was no pain difference if the dose was dropped voluntarily or involuntarily. This was not a prospective trial. It's simply a retrospective analysis where they asked them, hey, did your dose go down? Did you want that? And then they looked at the pain scores of those people. I don't want to suggest somebody actually did that involuntarily as part of a trial. But still, it is a signal that not all dose reductions are harmful. The A report that was more recently published by Hayes, also online only for the journal Addiction, looks at veterans who started chronic opioids at an earlier era, and they created a composite adverse outcome from VA records that was mostly based on diagnoses recorded there and not death. And there wasn't a sign of an increase in a composite adverse outcome among discontinuers, but the Authors wrote out all the limitations of the study. They were very detailed, but it still could be seen as favoring um, or at least not discouraging certain discontinuations. Retrospective statistical averages often obscure things we care about. So what's the argument against tapering or stopping opioids? Remember, I'm concerned about that. Well, the first thing to note is that opioids are not ineffective for pain. A, a review commissioned by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality as part of the support for the 2000, well, the rewrite of the CDC guideline found a benefit, even if opioids were not superior on average. And that review was authored by somebody who has taken a pretty strong stance uh, of skepticism about the liberal use of opioids uh, and is involved in writing that 2016 guideline. And it's, it's a review that many criticize, but still it finds a benefit. Usually individualized decisions would take evidence like this into account and use informed consent to deal with the fact that there's a risk because it's a trade-off. This is not normally a decision one should make as a clinician based on the clinician's personal values 
or on institutional pressures. Those are not usually how I make any other complicated medical decision. Opioid dose risk data also have not supported the prescribed dose as the primary driver of risk to the patient, which I'm going to show you in a moment. And crucially, reductions have not been found to confer safety. So I'm speaking to people involved in pharmacy science. This should be concerning. Most opioid drug poisoning deaths that occur, the thing we call overdose, in the prescription recipients occur at a low prescribed dose. So this is data from the VA. It's by Amy Bonner. I actually cited some of her data earlier. The red line shows the dose that was prescribed to the veterans who had died of overdose or drug poisoning death better from 2004 to 2009. The gray line shows the dose prescribed to those who did not die. It's a case control study. Obviously, the red line is displaced rightward from the gray line, which argues that there is some relationship between the dose that was prescribed and the risk of an overdose death. Although it doesn't tell you why the dose was elevated, it might have been elevated to people who were unstable, in despair, suffering with immense pain, feeling you know, out of sorts. But it also shows us that a dose-based approach to thinking about the thing that we're calling overdose misses most of the people at risk of the event that we wish to prevent. And it likely misconstrues why the event we're calling overdose actually happens. In essence, drug poisoning deaths, including opioids, are not just a simple question of pharmacy like a calcium channel block or overdose. In other VA data, which is now central to the risk management system we use in the Veterans Administration, uh, there is a profiling of all the retrospectively collected risk factors for both overdose and for suicide. As it turns out, the same risk factors predict both, which should give you a sense that the event we're talking about is a complex human event, not just a pharmaceutical one. This is from Elizabeth Oliva, who works at the VA Palo Alto, and they developed a model that we use today. And each of the bars is meant to show the elevation in risk in terms of a multiplier of risk associated with an individual risk factor. A co-prescribed benzodiazepine on the far left of the graph introduces a risk multiplier of 1.4 for death by overdose or suicide. Actually, in this model, it was events involving overdose or suicide, including death, but not just. Medical conditions are the blue bars. Psychological and addiction conditions are the purple bars. Red bars include inpatient mental health treatment history, detox history. All these events are markers of risk. I'm not saying they're all causes of risk, but they're markers of risk. In this model, the increment in risk you would get from going to 120 morphine milligram equivalents is about the same as the increment in risk from simply having a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder while receiving an opioid. That is, it's not just a pharmaceutical exposure, it's a person in a context with distress or lack of distress with the ability to manage it or the lack of ability to manage it. And the actual deaths that happen, and I'm not showing this, are typically chaotic deaths with multiple substances involved because somebody has spiraled out of control. There are now seven papers, I will briefly summarize, that suggest a safety risk to the reduction in prescription of opioids. I showed you the favorable ones already. So retro retrospective paper, stoppage in veterans was often followed by suicidal ideation or action. That was not a comparative paper, however. Dose variation in the Kaiser Permanente data from Colorado associated with an increase in overdose risk, whether it was upward or downward dose variation, stability is what seemed to be associated with the lowest risk. In a Vermont Medicaid cohort already at very high dose, most people who had a stoppage had it happen quickly, and there was often a need for emergency care thereafter. I'm not saying the stoppage was the cause of the need for emergency care. It could be that the doctor saw something incredibly concerning in the patient, was alarmed, the patient was selling drugs or blowing up in the clinic waiting room, whatever, they stopped the pills, but the patient clearly didn't seem to do well afterwards. Cessation of prescribed opioids in a small safety net clinic in Seattle was associated with the tripling of the risk of overdose death. That was statistically significant, but it was a small study. Often stoppage there was associated with concerning behaviors in the patients. Three more papers, <laughs> this doesn't stop. 
Cessation in Oregon and Medicaid was associated with three to five times risk of suicide events. And events here is a word meant to mean something found in diagnostic codes, not usually death. This is just published, it's still online, not yet in the paper version of the journal by Halvik. That's really important because Oregon is unique in having instituted a policy of mandating prescription opioid stoppage for a period of time, although they've reversed that policy. So they actually both mandated something and then had a Medicaid study to show what appears to be, I mean, on face, a possible harm from their policy. In VA data uh, from 2013 to 15, stoppage was associated with an increased risk of overdose and suicide. I helped write the paper, but the reasons for stoppage, whether the patients wanted it stopped or didn't want it stopped or how quickly it was done, none of those things are clearly known. And so we can't just say, oh, one thing caused the other. And in US national data, prescription opioid taper was associated with mental health crises and overdose events in a paper published in JAMA. I have a table showing that the blue bars are the tapered patients, the orange bars are the not tapered patients. All these are retrospective. And I really wanna make this very, very clear. The statistical average effects that we find across retrospective studies cannot support simple generalizations about cause and effect. We made simple generalizations about cause and effect with all the overdose literature that led to our current guidelines. But if we were to simply say that all the studies I just showed you prove cause and effect from a big database query, we'd be adopting the same simplistic logic that was used before. All that we could say is that these are enough papers to say that the harms that do happen merit study and they merit urgent remediation because we normally do not want to have our patients die as a result of something we do to them against their will in healthcare. So mandates to reduce, implied mandates to reduce, or to discharge the patient without care because you don't want them in your practice, those are now explicit or implicit in quality metrics. They're implicit in laws and clinic rules and in the thresholds for clinic investigation. And that's a concern given the data I've shown you, even if you're not sure if it's causal. In fact, my team, including people on this call, have taken up a study to recruit families who have lost somebody from suicide after opioid dose stoppage. It's called the CSI opioid study. I don't know how many have watched CSI Miami, but it's kind of meant to echo that. And we wanna learn how to prevent these deaths from happening. And we believe the better way to approach the problem is to study the events that are catastrophic and learn what really happened in detail and stop the statistical abstractions, which can only get you so far. In fact, the study was just funded by the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, last week. So we are eager to begin work. And if you know people who suffered these losses, let us know. So I'm gonna close with some lessons I've learned that might help others who wanna address problems in health policy. And I will be speaking in a way personally at this point, but I'm doing so because I, I believe some of you will at times decide to take a stand or decide to address a policy problem. And I want you to see what that, what's involved. So as a person, my responses to this crisis have involved clinical service and research, first and foremostly, and as a sideline, advocacy. And some of it led the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to revise policies based on petitions I led. I also helped get the CDC to clarify its own guideline in 2019 and say, you know, we didn't mean for it to be applied this way. And that work continues. But I do want to state that the conditions for patients remain dire. I hear from patients every day. And remember the thing I said about policy monopoly, because it affected how we elevated our prescribing of opioids in ways that were careless and how we reduced. People and agencies with aligned financial, scientific, and ideological commitments often work to contain opposing views. Um, this happened in a more explicit and public way when Someone chose to write an article about me with my help um, about the advocacy I was doing. That's actually me and a patient uh, seeing each other in clinic at the VA, complete with a VA publicity officer watching. There was some blowback. And in the article published about me in Stat News, I'll just give you a couple of quotes so you can see uh, just how unpleasant this can be. Dr. Anna Lemke says, and you may know her, she's written a book called Dopamine Nation. I haven't read it yet, but you might want to. I am really worried that people like Stefan Kertes, who is trying to champion patient-centered care in some ways are feeding into the same misleading messaging rolled out by Purdue and others that not to prescribe opioids is tantamount to torturing patients. In the same article from Adrian Fu Berman, also a professor 
Kerte certainly is very close to people who are being paid by opioid manufacturers, said Dr. Adrian Fruberman. He certainly worked with people with close ties to opioid manufacturers. And the key thing about an emergent policy monopoly is that the benefit is whoever has it doesn't get to have their, they don't have to have their claims checked when they make them to reporters. They just are reported and left unaddressed. But I'm going to address them, partly for my own reasons, but also to show you the real world that you have to deal with. The people, the person who spoke to me, Dr. Lemke, is a paid witness in litigation. And that wasn't initially disclosed in the article, although later reports suggest she was benefiting financially considerably from that work. That doesn't mean her views are not sincerely held, by the way, but hundreds of thousands of dollars is a lot of money. Uh, the other individual, also a paid witness in opioid litigation, also on record in videos I've recorded of opposing even research to study suicide after opioid taper. In truth, I have a decade of federally funded research on patient-centered care paid for by the VA. My papers on that question never have suggested that one would just prescribe pills to make patient-centered care better. I work on homelessness primarily. and That wouldn't be how I would approach that problem. The caricature is normal for political disputes, although not ideal for scholarly ones. And to my knowledge, the notion that I would work with people who are paid by the open industry, I don't think it's true. I certainly am a public employee and have been all my life. So some lessons learned. There are risks to challenging understandings. There were risks faced by the doctors in Virginia, like Art Van Zee, who said, there are real problems here with the way this OxyContin is flooding our community and kids are turning up dead. And he faced risks. And whoever raises those risks faces some blowback and blowback is real. My view of sticking to evidence is that it often requires providing evidence that's not simple and not spinning it, but showing both sides. It has pros and cons as an approach, but it remains my approach. I do think that there's enormous strength to be derived from working with others, some of the people who are on this call. Um, in terms of looking forward, it's important to understand that the future is not our present. The United States shifted from incredible permissiveness, reckless permissiveness in prescribing of opioids from my view to incredibly reckless restriction. The shift in policy in the policy analysis literature is termed punctuated equilibrium, a previously, a previously set uh, fixed set of stable relationships and understandings is interrupted often by a crisis and often by people coming together who form what's called an advocacy coalition. That doesn't mean they all work together individually, but they're people in a variety of positions who share a set of values, a set of causal assumptions and problem perceptions and who show a non-trivial degree of coordinated activity over time. It may be people in agencies, scientists, patients, somehow working together. And then those understandings shift. Um, and I suspect that will happen. When I look forward, what I see is promise in that regard um, as one example among many, there's a new organization that is not funded by pharma, that's crucial, the National Pain Advocacy Center, uh, started by a patient with long-term pain who happens to be a civil rights attorney and has extremely long experience in disability law, Kate Nicholson. And there are people on this call who are participants in its scientific advisory committee as I am, or in its patient advisory committee as Ms. Fuqua is. And gradually over time, and lots of scientists and legal people were trying to think about these issues without being naive uh, in the way that we were. With that, I wanna say thank you and say, if you want more information, I have an article in the journal Addiction and even a TEDx talk, which is a rather more dramatic presentation of some of these views. And with that, I'll stop my, um, my slide set and say, uh, we're open for questions if we can do any. Did I stop sharing my screen? I probably didn't. Oh, I did. I think you're good. Great. I'm open for questions. By the way, if you think what I've said is complete BS, I would just say it. Like I'm interested in debate and people who take different points of view. So <laughs> I'm open. I'll ask a question. Can you hear me? I actually can. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Hi, Dr. Thank you very much. I'm a, a proud UAB graduate in their biostatistics program. So thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is John Bentley and, and um, 
question for you about your definition of tapering. I mean, is it, there's a difference between a abrupt withdrawal and then tapering slowly over time. Yeah. Is that fair to say? First of all, there's a difference between, yes. And I, at some points in this, probably use the words carelessly. So in general, and I've seen it used multiple different ways. Taper often carries the implication that something is done gradually, although it doesn't clarify whether it was done with consent. Um, there is sometimes this view or hope that if you do something gradually, it assures a safe outcome. But across the seven papers that I reviewed are a few where they were looking at relatively modest dose changes and couldn't find a beneficial outcome. <laughs> and I want to say there are also studies in the ones reviewed by Joe Frank where they looked at modest dose changes and on statistical average for a meaningful contingent of people, they found a beneficial outcome. And when I speak to the people who are best at carrying out opioid tapers, and now I'm speaking from the experience of colleagues rather than large databases, many of them believe that their best experiences have worked where the patient consented to the process or where the patient was at least temporarily willing to entertain the experiment and where that was done very slowly. But I wanna highlight why there's some confusion. A lot of people would like to believe that if you just do it slowly, it'll always turn out okay. Opioid dependence is part of the bargain with prescribing opioids for long-term pain. Opioid dependence is not a yes, no, it's a spectrum. There are forms of opioid dependence we already know where tapering is a bad idea. The most extreme form would be opioid use disorder. In randomized trials that have tapered people with opioid use disorder off of buprenorphine, the results were abysmal. There are likely to be some patients with long-term pain who are not highly dysfunctional, who are dependent, for better or for worse, we can debate the moral value or the ethical value of it if we want, where tapering is gonna also produce a bad result. And I can assure you I've seen that happen also, but broadly speaking, there's certainly consensus that if this is to be undertaken, barring some extreme situations like a patient with a gun asking you for a prescription, um, you would do it gradually. Thank you. By the way, if they have a gun in front of me, I'm writing the prescription. <laughs> <laughs> I want to die. <laughs> Next. So, uh, Dr. Corsens, thank you so much for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. So my question is about uh, the tapering of opioids and its transition to other medications. Like uh, while uh, tapering the opioids, there is uh, one like uh, clinical guidance of transition to other medications like buprenorphine or methadone or switching to other medications like cannabis. So I want your opinion about the transition process and its uh, implications of transition to other medications. So there is a paper published by, uh, there's an observational retrospective paper published by a specialty opioid clinic, which was designed to deal with higher risk patients on high dose regular prescribed opioids. It's the author's name is Sturgeon. Like I think the sturgeon is a kind of fish, I think. Um, and it was published a year or two ago. And of the patients who were referred, uh, about 40% transitioned to buprenorphine um, and thought it was helpful. And about 30 or 35% who, and I'm, this is rough memory, who tried buprenorphine found it, it, they felt worse. They didn't like it. They didn't think it was helpful. And that's a retrospective study. And it's hard to know all that I would like to know about it. I personally, with buprenorphine, just to be clear with everyone, this is an opioid with partial agonist properties. It is definitely lower risk in terms of death. And there are some formulations of buprenorphine that are specifically FDA approved for pain. I have not seen a randomized clinical trial of patients at equal level of clinical stability, randomly after consent assigned to continuation of their prior regimen versus buprenorphine, which would be the easiest way to settle this matter. At this moment in time, I personally will change people over when I have repeated high-risk behaviors that I feel I cannot manage in, a, in an incredible way, including repeatedly turning up with cocaine <laughs> and just out of control behavior where it's like, wow, this is a high-risk person. I don't want to cut them off. And I, I just can't 
continue the oxycodone and I don't think they're redistributing. It's not that, it's just there's a chaos factor. I have colleagues who say this drug is great and they have great experiences changing patients over, but they need to do it carefully. But I don't think the science is in. With the other medications, cannabis, I, I don't believe it has proven to be a cure-all for pain. There's a great large trial where we're waiting for the results by Dr. Chinazo Cunningham also happens to be the head of an advisory group to CDC on its new guideline. Um, that will be a randomized controlled trial of opioids, of cannabis for pain. There clearly is some use of it, but I need to underscore that this is a category one DEA drug, meaning it's federally illegal, even if it's legal in states. And I personally am prohibited from recommending it, even though I'm allowed to hear about it as a federal employee. The other thing that happens, and you have Dr. Ramachandran is very interested in this, is non-medical switching, where physicians get nervous about the opioids, and in order to get the dose down, they apply on another psychoactive drug, such as gabapentin. And um, the risk equation there probably is one of increasing risk, although that's not fully proven. But there, you often have a patient who's at higher risk of sedation due to combined psychoactive, psychoactive drugs, um, and I've seen that happen anecdotally. That said, I'm not saying gabapentin is always bad for pain. I'm just saying the idea that you're going to make your prescription opioid numbers look good to your regulator by applying all your patients with another drug is concerning on its face when you don't have trial data that it's safe to do. Thank you. I want to see if uh, any of our um, Attendees over Zoom have any questions? We are, we are running close to time here. Three of them work with me. <laughs> <laughs> if I could offer a closing comment, um, I encourage you to take a look at the slides and to recognize that in the footnotes to the slides, I usually put at least the author's name in the journal, if not the DOI. The literature that I covered is extremely broad and often conflicting. Um, this area has tremendous scientific complexity. I have taken strong stands as an advocate, um, but a part of the reason I felt comfortable sharing with you was because I knew I was going to present studies that contradicted my advocacy stand. <laughs> Otherwise, I would feel I was engaged in spin, and I don't think that's the purpose of a university. Uh, so I hope that you'll look at the slides, and if you want to read some of the articles, they, they, they would be helpful. Dr. Gunas, I know we're running out of time. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed reading in your JGIM paper from last year that you shared with us uh, was this table at the bottom of the paper about these metrics for um, yes. opioid prescribing. Um, yeah. Comment about that and talk yeah. about whether you've seen them used or tested. Uh, no, that's the problem. So it's been so easy to focus on the easily measured thing right off the bat, the number of patients at over 90 milligrams or the number who get co-prescribed benzodiazepines. Health systems that are changing something could easily be mandated to measure whether the patients are alive or dead after there's been a change in their care. I mean, it's not hard to tell if someone's alive or dead. I said that in the TEDx talk, so I'm quoting myself, but it's not hard to check. And then you could do some focused follow-up on well, what deaths happened. Did those happen more often with certain people? Those are um, another, you know, we health systems could assess the percentage of people whose prescription opioid reduction involved a continuation of follow-up care or a termination of follow-up care. Was there an ending of the clinical relationship and associated with the reduction? Remember, reduction right now looks good on all metrics, but if all of those outcomes are associated with termination of the care relationship, which is a signal we have from multiple scientific papers, we should view that preemptively as bad, not good. And that's not hard to measure from administrative data. And my colleague, the scientific uh, brilliant person, Alison Varley, points that there are patient reported measures. There is nothing to stop insurers to look at people who are on opioids and to send them questionnaires about their care, their perceptions of their care, their level of pain, their level of function. Many of these are standardized down to just two or three questions. And they can ask what's happening to our people whose care has changed. They can ask the percentage of patients whose 
opioids have changed, who have now accessed an alternative form of pain care, which is operationalizable from large databases, even if you don't survey people. And these are ways that health systems could hold themselves to account. In the paper we sent out, though, we did highlight that the way change is enacted is highly sensitive to both external environmental pressures and to the internal culture of the organization itself. So for example, if you're mid-management and not top management, and you feel that there's a lot of pressure coming from the top to do something, it is very hard to tell the people at the top that there's a problem with what you're doing. This is a story of every single scandal in Washington, including in the government. People in the middle know what's wrong. They don't tell the people on the top because they are afraid to tell them. So psychological safety is a key element within organizations to assuring that information is collected broadly. Because this area is so hot with litigation, with anger, and with uh, frustration, there's not a lot of psychological safety. And a lot of people, including distributors, pharmacy chains, medical leaders, they feel under the gun and they just transmit that pressure downstream. And everyone holds their, holds their tongue while they have, a, you know, at the worst, they have security guards escort their patients out of the office after their prescriptions are stopped. I mean, that's an internal factor that really changes how we do care changes. And we could measure how we're changing care if we choose to move beyond just counting pills. That is fair. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson. I see somebody on Zoom has their hand uh, raised. If you want to ask a question. Uh, crucially, please. because Ms. Fuqua has a question. Uh, she's incredibly respectful, but has been the one who alerted me to the deaths by suicide because she's been tracking them for years on years. Uh, Ms. Fuqua, do you want to write it or say it? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you um, talked about some things that insurers um, and large organizations can do. What can these uh, buddy pharmacists, um, you know, pharmacy students and um, pharmacists in community or hospital practices, how can they um, work to support patients that are being paid for if they want to get involved in this from an advocacy perspective? Uh, what um, recommendations do you have for them? For pharmacists and pharmacy uh, people, first of all, if you're working in a pharmacy, it's really important to recognize when somebody who's on long-term opioids is about to have them cut off because of a weird malfunctioning system. That happens a lot. It can involve the PDMP, where pharmacists aren't allowed to check it up. It can involve payment issues. And advocating on behalf of the person in front of you is always a good thing to do if you're in a clinical role. But there are also pharmacists who rise to positions of leadership. And I think they can play a different role. Sometimes it's the temptation because one is in pharmacy leadership to sort of couch opioid stewardship as making the pills go down. And I think it's much better to make sure that your opioid stewardship efforts are uh, tied to pain management efforts in the same institution if you're working institutionally and tied to other professionals who live outside the world of pharmacy so that your perspective is a rounded one and you can begin to advocate for making sure pain care moves forward. I think the other thing pharmacy policy people can do is to assess that sort of the challenges that result when there's changes to um, prescribing that involve the addition of new drugs in order to make up for the removal of another. Those are high risk situations that deserve attention. And I think honestly, I personally will just speak from experience. There's a lot of VA pharmacists who help me out day to day um, when I'm trying to make decisions. I rely both on nurses and pharmacists in part to understand the rules around the drugs and also to understand the patients. And usually when I have the toughest prescribing situations, I triangulate the insights from myself, the nurses I work with, and the pharmacists I work with to figure out what's the best thing to do for the patient. All right. We are over time, so we don't have any more questions. I wanna be respectful of Dr. Curtis's time here. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.